Father Larry. This is going to hopefully wrap up chapter 8 now of John's Gospel. So let's start with a prayer in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let's take a moment to recollect ourselves in the presence of Almighty God and invite the Holy Spirit to open our hearts and minds. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Now and at the hour of our death, amen. Our Lady's seat of wisdom, pray for us. St. John, pray for us. St. Jerome, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So we got a lot to do here, a lot to do. I really would like to finish this chapter off. Uh, so let's uh, kick off with verse 42. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded and came forth from God. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks according to his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear God I'm sorry, the reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. All right, let's stop there. Um, proceeded and came forth from God. What an astounding thing to say, you know. You imagine you're arguing with somebody and you tell them, uh, Hey, I proceeded and came forth from God. Uh that's a pretty uh, radical thing, radical, bold claim. Um, but our Lord can make it because he is. He's, uh, he was uh, in the beginning with God. Remember the prologue? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I want to look at a passage from Wisdom chapter 18 here for a second. Listen to this. It's so beautiful. For a while, gentle silence enveloped all things, and night in its swift course was now half gone. Thy all-powerful word leaped from heaven, from the royal throne, into the midst of the land that was doomed. A stern warrior carrying the sharp sword of thy authentic command and stood and filled all things with death and touched heaven while standing on the earth. That last statement's amazing to me. Touched heaven while standing on the earth? Um, sounds an awful lot like Jacob's ladder. All right, but it's a sign of the incarnation, okay? Proceeded and came forth from God. From the very royal throne, he leaped forth from heaven um, uh, one more, uh, let's look at, well, we're all familiar with this passage from Galatians in the fullness of time. When the time had fully come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. All right. So, um, proceeded and came forth from God. He just tells him straight up. This is like a heavyweight battle here, a heavyweight fight. Um, I watch a lot of boxing 
and wrestling, not professional wrestling. I'm talking collegiate and world wrestling, freestyle and folk style uh, wrestling, okay? The real kind. That was my sport. So, uh, yeah, I've just been watching a good bit of it lately. We just had the world championships. America won the world title, uh, world team title. And we had one, two, three gold medals and a couple bronzes. We really tore it up. Um, so, anyway, Russia wasn't in it, though, because of the U war with Ukraine. They got kicked out. But still, um, we did great. Now, your father is the devil. So this is like a, uh, the analogy here is like a wrestling match of two superstars, two undefeated champions, you know, going up against each other. That's when it really gets exciting. Uh, when you have the Celtics and the Lakers or whatever. Uh, when you have two just beasts uh, going at it. Um, that's what we see here. It's just, it's just a slugfest here. Uh, and it's getting worse and worse. You know, it's, it seems like this whole gospel, you know, there's been kind of like sparring matches with the Pharisees in chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. It's like, you know, and uh, man, now they're really opening up. Boom, 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 boom. So um, your father is the devil. Now he was kind of implying this before. He was alluding to their father before who was not Abraham, and they're trying to say their father is God. Now he comes straight out and says it. What a shocking thing to say. Your will is to do your father's desires. You are of your father, the devil. Wow. Let's not forget, though, St. John the Baptist called them a brood of vipers. He called the Pharisees, okay? And our Lord at one point calls Peter Satan. Or at least he says, get behind me, Satan. All right? Um, yeah. So, yes, as shocking as this is, our Lord says they're whited sepulchers. I mean, there's some really strong language in Matthew 23 when he lambastes them and all his uh, cascade of woes. All right? Full of dead men's bones and all corruption. So, our Lord and St. John the Baptist call them a brood of vipers. Um, so yeah, but here, this is taking it to a whole nother level saying that their father is the devil. The son of God says that to you. Oh my goodness. That is, that is tough. All right. So he's hard on them. He's hard on them. Like Pope Francis is hard on the clergy. He's rough on the clergy, man. He's like, Mr. Mercy. Captain Merciful to everybody. He's so merciful, but he, uh, he really lambastes the clergy. He's always blasting us on, you know, and uh, putting it on us. Uh, but our Lord did the same thing, you know. I mean, in Luke, he says, to whom more has been given, more will be required. He asks a lot of those who step up into a leadership role in his church. Um, yeah, well... Uh, it's going to be rough to be a priest on Judgment Day. Uh, your knees are going to be buckling. All right. Um, all right. So next he says uh, he was a murderer from the beginning. He was a murderer from the beginning. You know, let's go back to uh, Cain. When you think of Cain, this is a point that uh, John's going to make in uh, 1 John. Um. 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 to 15. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, and not be like Cain, who was of the evil one, and murdered his brother. Why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil, and his brother's righteous. Do not wonder, brethren, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. And he who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. 
So Cain was of the evil one. Um, so what our Lord's saying here is something that John is going to say later again in his own letter. All right, his first letter. Now, uh, I want to dwell on this business of um, how uh, the devil has nothing, notice, nothing to do with the truth. Zero to do with the truth. No thing, nothing. Um, that's a pretty amazing statement. Nothing to do with the truth. I mean, he poses as an angel of light sometimes, you know. He might mix truth with lies, but uh, that's always for the sake of the lie, uh, for the sake of the deception. So even when he's telling a truth, uh, mixing truth with lies, um, it's really part of the lie. He really has nothing to do with the truth. Now, I want to talk about fallen angels here while we're talking about all this think it would be good to review what the church teaches about the fallen angels. So let's read here from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Behind the disobedient choice of our first parents lurks a seductive voice opposed to God, which makes them fall into death out of envy. Scripture and the church's tradition see in this being a fallen angel called Satan or the devil. The church teaches that Satan was at first a good angel made by God. The devil and the other demons were indeed created naturally good by God, but they became evil by their own doing. And when they become evil, because their choice is made in eternity, okay, and, and when an, angels are outside time and space, Okay, when they make this choice, it's a whole and total, complete choice with the entirety of their being. Okay, so they are holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy, as in entire and completely, entirely evil. Okay, we are called to hate evil. God loves those who hate evil. Okay, uh can actually hate the devil okay because he is the evil one um so i know we're trained not to hate and that seems like such a bad thing do not hate uh well the lord loves those who hate evil the lord loves those who hate the evil one um and the lord loves those who hate evil and the evil one Okay, um, yeah, you hear this throughout the scriptures. I mean, we can look at another one if you want, just for fun. Amos. See what Amos says here. Seek good and not evil that you may live. Hate evil, hate evil, and love good. Well, demons, uh, you know, we shouldn't hate other people who are just fallen creatures who are, you know, we can't look into them and judge their hearts but we can judge the demon the demons uh these diabolical forces uh beings okay are whole w h o l l y evil um completely evil um and to hate them it's funny there's this book uh paralandra it's second volume in the space trilogy by c.s lewis where the hero ransom is uh duking it out talk about boxing he goes toe to toe with the devil who has uh, basically inhabited the corpse of this guy i know it's crazy and they're on this floating island on venus okay the planet venus and they're in a fist fight it actually comes down to fisticuffs. Uh, so here he is, a philologist, you know, from teaching at Cambridge or whatever. And he gets the angel, this archangel takes him to Venus. You just got to read the book. It's an incredibly profound book. Uh, but he actually has a fist fight with the devil. And he actually summons within himself hate for the devil. 
And I think C.S. Lewis is basically making this point uh, that it's appropriate in this case of the demonic to actually hate them. We don't hate other people because we can't judge them, but the demons are judged evil, entirely evil by the Lord. Uh, and we can freely hate them. Okay? Just like we hate evil, we hate the evil one. Diddle, diddle, diddle. All right, now, um, but human beings are not entirely evil. We're fallen, we're wounded, okay? But we are not wholly, H-O, I got to stop saying that. We're not entirely evil, okay? Um, and we should not hate other human beings uh, who are still redeemable. Up until the last minute, God can redeem any of us. We cannot look inside the heart of another human being and judge them in order, you know, and hate them. I don't care if it's Adolf Hitler. You know, we really shouldn't hate the person. We love the person. We're called to love the person. Okay, uh, that's not the case when it comes to the demonic. All right, now let's read on in the Catechism. Scripture speaks of a sin of these angels. This fall consists in the free choice of these created spirits who radically and irrevocably, okay, they are not redeemable. Radically and irrevocably rejected God and his reign. We find a reflection of that rebellion in the tempter's words to our first parents, you will be like God. I mean, when he straight up says the exact opposite of what God said, when he tells Eve, you will not die. When God had told Adam, you will die. The day you eat of it, you will die. The devil just turns that on its head and says, you will not die. That is diabolical. All right. We find a reflection of that rebellion in the tempter's words to our first parents. You will be like God. The devil has sinned from the beginning. He is a liar and the father of lies. Quoting John chapter 8 here. It is the irrevocable character of their choice and not a defect in the infinite divine mercy that makes angels sin unforgivable. There is no repentance for the angels after their fall, just as there is no repentance for men after death. Once we enter eternity, once we die, uh, we are who we are, okay? And our choice is made at that point. Um, so it's not that God's infinite mercy is, is, is unproductive here, ineffective, ineffectual. Uh, no, it's that their, their choice was complete, entire, and irrevocable, radical choice. It continues, Scripture witnesses to the disastrous influence of the one Jesus calls a murderer from the beginning, who would even try to divert Jesus from the mission received from his father, you know, the temptation in the wilderness. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. In its consequences, the gravest of these works was the mendacious seduction that led man to disobey God. The power of Satan is nonetheless not infinite. He is only a creature powerful from the fact that he is a pure spirit, but still a creature. He cannot prevent the building up of God's reign. Although Satan may act in the world out of hatred for God and his kingdom in Christ Jesus, and although his action may cause grave injuries of a spiritual nature and indirectly even of a physical nature to each man and to society, the action is permitted by divine providence, which with strength and gentleness guides human and cosmic history. It is a great mystery that providence should permit diabolical activity. But we know that in everything, God works for good 
with those who love him. Romans 8.28. The divine synergy. God works for good with us. All right. Now, um, there's one more quote I want to look at here. And that is when it's talking in the Our Father about... Um, and it says that, uh, where is it? Well, when it's talking about, where is it? Um, I'll just have to find it here. Hang on a second. Um, this is, uh, something to take to prayer quite literally when you say the our father just realize what the catechism says here about that petition deliver us from evil you know we think of it oftentimes when we say that prayer as some sort of abstraction abstract notion of evil when in fact paragraph 2851 of the catechism on the our father says this in this Petition, deliver us from evil. Evil is not an abstraction, but refers to a person, Satan, the evil one, the angel who opposes God, the devil, the diabolos, bale to throw in the prepositional prefix dia, literally means to throw apart. That's what diabolical means. It's the one who throws himself across or apart. God's plan and his work of salvation accomplished in Christ. So in this petition, we're really praying for deliverance from the evil one, from Satan himself, not just some abstract notion of evil. So think about that when you're praying this. <coughs> People don't think about that. That's what the church teaches. All right, now, uh, what else do we want to look at? When he says that, he is the father of lies, and that makes you think twice about lying, doesn't it? When we lie, somehow a lie within us is engendered, you know, born of the evil one. It is the work of the evil one in our heart, uh, giving birth to a lie. Uh, if he's, if we lie, well. Satan is the father of lies. In chapter 5 of the Acts of the Apostles, you have this really disturbing uh, uh, encounter between Peter and uh, Ananias and his wife, Sapphira. And uh, what St. Peter says to Ananias, who withholds, you know, he lies about, uh, you know, what he's bringing, he brings only a part and lays it at the apostles' feet of the proceeds, of his proceeds. He kept back something for himself, and basically he lied. And uh, Peter reads his soul and says, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? How is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. When we lie... We think we're getting away with it. He sees the secret sins in his countenance, you know. Um, secret sins are not kept back from his countenance. Psalm 90. Our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee. Okay, look, uh, you think we can lie, but we can't really lie to God. God cannot be deceived. He cannot deceive, nor can he be deceived. All right? So uh, that is a disturbing scene there between Peter, Ananias, and Sapphira. It's like, uh, wow, Peter calls him out. Um, that, uh, yeah, this whole thing has uh, been the work of the evil one in their hearts. Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? So when we lie, we lie to other people. We also lie to God. And Satan has filled our heart 
uh, when we lie. It makes you think twice about ever lying again. Second Thessalonians. Uh, where is it now? Just chapter 2 here. It's all about the uh, Antichrist in Second Thessalonians 2. And he's the lawless one. The man of lawlessness. And those who follow him refused to love the truth and so be saved. Okay? To be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. And belief in the truth is part of salvation. To be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Wow. Wow where they refuse to love the truth and so be saved, okay? Those who follow the lawless one, okay? Who goes about lying through wicked deception. Um, all right, so the father of lies. Now, let's contrast this with the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, full of grace and truth. We heard at the beginning here, uh, came into the world as the light, okay? And um, full of grace and truth. Um, now, so our Lord is the exact opposite, and and we're going to talk about that. Let's let's begin this little reflection though, just by the basic idea that God does not lie. Okay. God does not lie. I know that's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, but let's just hear the testimony of sacred scripture about this fact. Numbers 23, 19. This is the prophecy of Balaam. One of the prophecies of Balaam. God is not man that he should lie. Or a son of man that he should repent. Okay, God's not like us. Yep, he does not lie. Let's jump to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18. It says here, um, It is impossible that God should prove false. It's impossible. Uh, Titus is even more clear. Uh, Titus just straight up says, Um, in hope of eternal life, which God, God who never lies, who never lies. Okay, uh, let's hear from the Catechism of the Catholic Church on this. This is a great statement here from the Catechism, paragraph 156. Uh, We believe because of the authority of God himself who reveals things. God who can neither deceive nor be deceived. God can neither deceive nor be deceived. All right. Um, God cannot. You can't deceive him. You can't pull the wool over God's eyes. And he cannot be deceived. And our Lord is just pure truth, pure goodness. He came to bear witness to the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He came full of grace and truth. Okay, the light of the world. All right, just amazing contrast between these two. All right, Jesus is sinless. When he says here, uh, who of you will convict me? Hold on. Um, which of you convicts me of sin? Wow. Which of you convicts me of sin? You know? Um, well, he is sinless. Let's look at a couple passages here about the sinless nature of God. Just to reflect on this a little bit and then make this transference to our Lord here. The statement of Moses in his great prayer song chapter 32 of Deuteronomy the rock his work is perfect for all his ways are justice a God of faithfulness and without iniquity just and right is he 
no iniquity in God. Zero. Cannot be tolerated in his presence. When we get to heaven, when we're sanctus, okay, when we're made entirely sanctus and holy, okay, everything will be, we will be completely pure. Completely and entirely pure of sin. It's an awesome thing to imagine. We really don't even know what that looks like. Uh, but that's the reality, folks. And that's the only way we'll be able to withstand the presence of God. Um, the finished work of grace, a, a saint. All right, now uh, let's look at Psalm 92. Jump to the Psalms and read here. Psalm 92, verse 15. Um, there is no unrighteousness in him. The Lord is upright. He is my rock. And there is no unrighteousness in him. Very similar to what Moses said. All right. <clears throat> now, um, uh, let's look at Isaiah 53, 9. And hear about the suffering servant. Getting closer to a more specific reference to our Lord's holiness now with this description of the suffering servant here. 53.9 They made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Zero. Zippo, let's go to uh, Hebrews here. Hebrews 4.15, he was tempted in every way, in every respect. He's been tempted as we are, yet without sinning, without sinning. And lastly, let's look at 1 Peter 2.22. Um, Christ has also suffered to you, for you. He committed no sin. No guile was found in his lips. So our Lord, oh, to think about the purity of our Lord. So awesome to consider um, in these scenes where he's surrounded by such wickedness, lies and murderous thoughts. And our Lord in the midst of all this, paragraph 578. Jesus, Israel's Messiah, and therefore the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, was to fulfill the law by keeping it in its all-embracing detail, according to his own words, down to the least of these commandments. He is, in fact, the only one who could keep it perfectly. On their own admission, the Jews were never able to observe the law in its entirety without violating the least of its precepts. That's why they had to have the Day of Atonement and put the sins of Israel on a goat and send it out into the wilderness, okay? The Day of Atonement. Confessing all their sins on the head of a goat. All right. Um, Jesus is sinless. He is at total enmity. Total enmity. As the seed of the woman... He is at total enmity with the evil one. Okay? For what partnership, St. Paul says, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 and 15 here, what partnership have righteousness and iniquity? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Okay? The devil. Um, it's the seed of the woman here. The seed of the woman and versus the serpent. Okay, they are at total enmity with each other. Um, both the woman and the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. All right, total enmity. Your offspring and her offspring. Okay, and our Lord's... So, basically telling these Pharisees that they are the offspring of the devil. Uh, what fellowship does Christ have with the devil? Zero. Zero fellowship. Total opposition, total enmity. That's what that means. They are enemies, not frenemies. Enemies. Okay? 
as we ought to be with the evil one as well. Now, um, unfortunately, yeah, we are not sinless. I know it's unnecessary to do this, but since we're talking about our Lord's holiness, uh, let's not deceive ourselves and uh, think for a second that we're pure from sin. Proverbs 20, verse 9, Who can say, I have made my heart clean? I am pure from my sin. Okay? We're not pure right now. Someday, maybe we will be. God willing, we get to heaven because there's no way we're going to be able to withstand it. Told you that. Strive for peace with all men and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Uh, this is uh, Hebrews 12, 14. Holiness, strive for that holiness without which no one will see the Lord. We will not be able to withstand the beatific vision until we are completely and utterly holy. H-O-L-Y. Holiness without which no one will see the Lord and we are simply not down here uh, in a holy state. I know... I don't need to belabor this point whatsoever. Uh, but, uh, yep, let's all, it's good to just, you know, hear yourself to hear yourself say it and feel solidarity with everybody in this field hospital of the church. When we come in here, we're sinners, all of us. Uh, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and sin did my mother conceive me, David says. Psalm 51, verse 5, you know, makes it explicitly clear that it's from birth. It's from birth. St. Paul says, all men have fallen short, have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All right. So we're sinners, folks. Right now, let's read to the end of the chapter now. Um. I'm going to continue on with verse 48 and read all the way to 58. Jesus answered him, are you not, I'm sorry, <laughs> the Jews answered him. Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I have not a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he will be the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. And you say, If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death? Are you greater than our father Abraham, who died? And the prophets died? Who do you claim to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say that he is your God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I said I do not know him, I should be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he was to see my day. He saw it and was glad. The Jews then said to him, You're not fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. All right, so yeah, when he really hits home, you know, they he started hitting home with them earlier in this argument, and they busted out the, well, we weren't born of fornication, implying that he was perhaps, perhaps, According to Origen and St. Thomas, you know, seems favorable to that 
interpretation here that they're implying something about our Lord's mysterious origin and doubt and suspicion. Um, so yeah, that's what we call an ad hominem argument against the man. Okay, ad the prepositional, the preposition ad signifies motion to or towards something. So towards the man, you know, you're uh, casting dispersions, heaping scorn. You're you're uh, attacking. It's a personal attack on somebody. It's the uh, weakest form of argument. The odd home in them. So it's kind of a sign of desperation if you're in a debate and somebody appeals to the odd home in them arguments. Uh, so they're attacking him and calling him a Samaritan and telling, you know, saying he has a demon. Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? And Jesus doesn't say he's not a Samaritan, which is interesting. Certain solidarity there. He has with all of Israel, ultimately. Um, I have not a demon, though, he does say. He does say that explicitly. I do not have a demon. So he absolutely rejects uh, this statement. But just notice first, the perfect composure of our Lord, the Son of God. Can you imagine if you or I were the Son of God? completely pure of sin and we heard this kind of stuff somebody telling us that we had a demon uh that we're a samaritan and have a demon just dishonoring him he says as much he's like you know i honor my father you dishonor me you are dishonoring me uh but you know that's exactly the character of the suffering servant here this humility characterizes the suffering servant um when it says that he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Okay. Um, yeah, there's just something here for all of us when we're insulted um, to just see how good our Lord is, his humility. He's willing to put up with this kind of thing. Um, Christ has called you... Uh, when he was reviled, St. Peter says in 1 Peter 2, verse 23, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he trusted to him who judges justly. All right, so uh, the perfect composure of Jesus, the face of such a brutal insult, telling the Son of God that he has a demon inside him, living inside of him. He's under the domination of the devil, possessed by the evil one. Unbelievable, blasphemous statement. Um, now, next in verse 51 here, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. To keep his word. Um, we'll never see death. I need a fizzy water. Can you hang on a quick sec? Let's talk about this. First of all, it's a Hebraism, a Hebraism. Um, you see examples of it. So it could be could be that he's really referring to Psalm 89, which is a messianic psalm, okay, about the son of David, about the Messiah ultimately. Um, and it's all about the covenant with David, God made with David in 2 Samuel 7 through the prophet Nathan. The coming of a son of David is what the people are waiting for. They're in expectation of a Messiah. This is a royal psalm, kind of a messianic. This is the better way to put this, a messianic psalm. Um, and they're struggling in Psalm 89 with, you know, their situation. And they've been uh, t 
10 northern tribes were destroyed by Assyria and now they're deported to Babylon in the south. And they just don't understand the tree got chopped down, the tree of Jesse, uh, David's father. And the Davidic line came to an end after 400 years. It seems so promising. So how long, O Lord, will thou hide thyself forever? How long will thy wrath burn like fire? Remember, O Lord, what the measure of life is. For what vanity thou hast created all the sons of men. What man can live and never see death? Never see death. That's a Hebraism. Okay, you see it here in Psalm 89, verse 48. And our Lord's using that same expression, so it could very well be. They're lamenting the fact that no man uh, can live and never see death. And our Lord is saying the exact opposite. It's like he's responding to the psalmist in Psalm 89. Who can deliver his soul from the power of Sheol? Remember, O Lord, how thy servant is scorned, how I bear in my bosom the insults of the peoples. Interesting. So very, this is very interesting. Now, um, some other examples of this uh, we can look at. I mean, Luke 2.26, and you see Zechariah here was promised. Let's listen to that. Uh, Simeon, I'm sorry. Simeon and the man, Simeon. Okay, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. That he would not see death. So, um, when our Lord says this, uh, this is a Hebraism. Uh, that's just the first point we want to make. And clearly, clearly he acknowledges that we're going to die a physical death for lying out crowd. Our Lord obviously knows we're going to die. So what then is he referring to here? Because, you know, he's very explicitly clear about death. Um When in Matthew twenty-two thirty-two here it says, uh, you know Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Here he's arguing the Sadducees, you know, who are trying to deny the resurrection. And he says, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. So. Our bodily death is not really truly death in the ultimate sense. Real death is the second death that we hear about in the book of Revelation all over the place, okay? That's really what our Lord's talking about here. He does not consider bodily death to be the real death of the person. The real death of the person occurs uh, when we're cast into the fiery lake, okay? He who conquers shall not be hurt by the second death. I will give you the crown of life. He says to the church in Smyrna. All right. Um, yeah, you hear this in the uh, chapters 19, chapter 20 and 21 here. Uh, Over such the second death has no power. The second death, the lake of fire, the second death. All right, look. Um, yeah. Um, second death is what our Lord's talking about. And uh, when you look at what he says in Matthew 22 to the Sadducees arguing about the resurrection, you know, even those who've died, our Lord's like, hey, look, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they are living here and now. They exist. Okay? Uh, God is the God of the living. They didn't die in the strict sense. There's life after death. An opportunity for life after death. And, um, all right, so that, I think, uh, clears that up. Keeping his word, our Lord says, is a criterion, a determining factor in whether or not we are saved 
he says here very explicitly in verse 51, truly, truly, even leads into it with amen, amen, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. He will never see the lake of fire. He will never see the second death. If he keeps my word. All right. So we got to keep his word. What must we do to be saved? That is the question for all of us. And there's no real easy answer. You know, we want to make it nice and tidy and easy. And we latch on to some verse or other but uh you know it's always going to resist us a little bit because the concept of salvation is kind of a zip file all right there's a lot that goes on that hot dog mustard relish ketchup a lot goes into it okay to borrow that analogy from somebody i heard speaking about this in a debate one time a catholic who was trying to explain this i think it was michael barber um dr michael barber i think uh, but, uh, yeah, it's a zip file. There's many aspects of salvation. I just, you know, uh, and we can't fixate exclusively on one singular text as though that exhausts all the requirements for salvation. All I want to do is, is rip through some things in the New Testament, just in the New Testament, to make this, to illustrate this point. And when our Lord says, if, if a man keeps my word, if a man, if, if, truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death if he keeps my word. All right. Well, that's one aspect of salvation. We got to keep his word guarded. What are some other things that uh, the New Testament says? Well, think of the rich young man in Matthew's gospel. Our Lord tells him, if you would enter life, keep the commandments. All right. In Luke's gospel, his sermon on the plain, he says, forgive and you will be forgiven. So if we're going to be forgiven, we have to forgive. It's contingent upon whether or not we forgive. Again, in Luke, he says, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake, he will save it. So here, we now we find out we got to lose our life. We got to carry our cross daily. We got to lose our life. Whoever loses his life will save it. Will save it. Uh, next, he who endures to the end will be saved. Our Lord says multiple times. He who endures to the end. So we got to endure to the end is an aspect of salvation. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, our Lord says at the end of Mark's gospel. Chapter 16, verse 16. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Of course, we've already heard in John's gospel to Nicodemus, unless you are born of water and spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you're born of water and spirit. And in chapter 6, he said, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. In the Acts of the Apostles, when everybody's cut to the heart at the Pentecost preaching of Peter, they say, what shall we do? And he says, repent and be baptized. Okay? In Acts 16, when the uh, Philippian jailer turns to Paul, says, you know, what shall I do to be saved? He says, believe in the Lord Jesus. And what did he do then? He was baptized along with his whole family. St. Paul famously says in Romans 10, 9, you get this all the time from Protestants. If you ask this question, this is what they'll quote. Romans 10, 9, confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your hearts that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. All right. Throw that on the hot dog, too. That's one aspect of salvation, but it's just part of a larger zip file. All right, next. If any man's work burns up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. That's where we get the doctrine of purgatory, 1 Corinthians 3.15. 
on the day, capital D, the day of our own particular judgment, some people's life's work is going to burn up. But they themselves will be saved. They will suffer loss, probably loss of the beatific vision, but they will be saved, but only as through fire. Only as through fire. One of the words for fire in Latin is pergio, so purgatory. Yeah, we made up the word, just like we made up the word trinity. Uh, but uh, the truth of the doctrine of the trinity is in the scriptures, and the truth of purgatory is in the scriptures. So some of us are going to be saved, but only as through fire. Next, St. Paul says, I would remind you, brethren, in what terms I preached to you the gospel which you received, in which you stand, by which you are saved. If you hold it fast, unless you believed in vain. So you got to hold it fast. He says that they refuse to love the truth. We already heard that in Second Thessalonians when they're deceived by this lawless one. Okay. They refused those who are deceived by this lawless one, the Antichrist, St. Paul says. Those who refuse to love the truth... We're not saved through love of the truth. Loving the truth is an aspect of salvation. Take heed to yourself and to your teaching, St. Paul says, Timothy. Hold to that, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So we got to take heed to ourselves and to our teaching and hold to that. That's a part of salvation. James he says, receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Whoever brings back a sinner, James says, from the error of his ways will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So evangelization, winning somebody back from the error of their ways uh, is part of salvation. Will save his soul. Whoever does this will save his soul. Last, lastly, Peter just says in his first letter, 321, baptism now saves you, okay? Baptism, back to baptism again. So all these things are aspects. They all go on the hot dog here. They're all aspects of salvation. Keeping the commandments. Forgiving other people if we expect to be forgiven, okay? Uh, enduring to the end. Believe and are baptized born of water and the spirit eat my flesh and drink my blood repent and be baptized believe confess with your lips believe in your hearts only as through fire if you hold it fast love the truth take heed to yourself and your teaching receive with meekness the implanted word whoever brings back a sinner baptism all these things the new testament says have to do with our salvation, our aspects of our salvation. So when our Lord says here, Amen, Amen, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Is that a true statement? Yes. Can we hang the whole of salvation on that statement? And to the exclusion of all the other things that are said in the scriptures, in the New Testament alone, about salvation. They are all aspects of this one large Zip file. Now, this is great here in verse 53. Who do you claim to be? Who do you claim to be? That's a great question. That Everything hangs on that question, really. The question is for the whole human race. Who do you claim to be? Wow. Wow. Who is Jesus? That is the question for all of us. Every day we need to answer that question. Come back to it in a fresh way. Who is Jesus? All right. Who do you claim to be? I just love that. He's God with us. Greater than Abraham, Solomon, Jonah, the temple. Greater than the Sabbath. Greater than David. He's David's Lord. Okay. He's greater than Jacob. He's greater... He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's God with us, Emmanuel. Okay? Um, our Lord, the Son of God, equal to the Father, proceeded and came forth from God. Uh, the awesomeness. Who do you claim to be? 
That's a powerful question. Who do you claim to be? So now he talks about Abraham here in verse 56. Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Amazing. Your father Abraham rejoiced when that he was to see my day. He saw it and was glad. This is a very mysterious thing our Lord says. I like to think about this. St. John Chrysostom, doctor of the church, 4th century says, My day, when it says Abraham rejoiced to see my day, my day seems to me to mean the day of the crucifixion, which Abraham foreshadowed typically by the offering of the ram and of Isaac. Typically, not in the sense of, uh, we usually use that word, but typologically, okay, uh, in an allegorical way, it prefigured uh, the crucifixion. Uh, when uh, Moses, excuse me, Abraham was instructed to take Isaac up Mount Moriah and sacrifice him, his only son. Uh, prefigured, typically, in a typological manner, uh, the crucifixion. So this day is really the day of the crucifixion for uh, Chrysostom. And Abraham has seen it, but at this point in the narrative story of this gospel, it hasn't happened yet. So how is Abraham seeing it? Let's go to that next question. Well, uh, he could have seen it by vision. You know, I mean, he did fall into a deep sleep like Adam. And when there was the smoking fire pot and the flaming torch, okay, that went through the animal parts while he was in this deep sleep, okay, this trance-like state um yeah maybe he saw a vision there you know um jacob saw the vision of the ladder i mean and he wrestled with a man all night abraham had the visitation of the three men i mean he these guys were seeing some amazing things visions so maybe he foresaw that i mean he says prophetically in Genesis 22, 8, God will provide himself the lamb of sacrifice. Okay, so maybe Abraham is looking out into the future prophetically. He is seeing uh, my day. And maybe that's what our Lord means. He saw it in a vision, maybe, and was glad. When he saw the smoking fire pot, the flaming torch, going through the animal parts, it's like God's telling him, I'm going to uphold both sides of the covenant. I'm going to do it. And when God said, when Abraham's like, God will provide himself the lamb, and then he sees this ram that God, after he stays his hand from slaughtering his own son, God provides this ram. Maybe all of this is, is kind of a prophetic vision. And Abraham is seeing my day. Maybe that's what our Lord means here. Or maybe in eternity. Now he sees up there from the mountaintop with God, the whole plan of God from the beginning to the end of time, perhaps. I don't know. Could be either or both, for crying out loud. Um, but, uh, but it's an interesting thing to think about, isn't it? Let's look at paragraph 706. Of the Catechism of the Catholic Church here um, says, uh, Against all human hope, God promises descendants to Abraham as the fruit of faith and of the power of the Holy Spirit. In Abraham's offspring, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And this offspring will be Christ himself. Um, I don't want to go into that paragraph right now i was thinking about it but i'm gonna i'm gonna move on so let's just leave it right there rejoice to see my day verse 58 before abraham was i am now this is an amazing statement because it's in the present tense think about it it begins with the past tense before abraham was i am what Doesn't even make any sense. Unless you're God. Unless you just are being itself. Um, so this is one of these uh, 
I am statements, the ego, Amy statements you find throughout John. And this one validates the other I am statements that he made in this chapter already when he said, unless you believe that I am he, that I am, ego, Amy, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. And then he says, when you've lifted up the son of man, then you will know that I am he. Okay. Um, I am. So these other two prior I am statements are now confirmed in that interpretation that radical interpretation that these are these are statements uh, about his divinity that he is Yahweh that he is the Lord because here it's just so incredibly explicit truly truly I say to you before Abraham was I am what an amazing amazing thing to say um, now, what does John, St. John Chrysostom say about this? He does not say before Abraham was, I was. That's what we might say. Before Abraham was, I was. You know, if you got a little brother, you could say, hey, before Junior was, I was. I already walked around for two years before you came along, you little punk. All right. Uh, I was the youngest, so... I never had a little brother, little sister, a junior to say that to, but. All right, so before Abraham was, I was. That's what you might expect him to say, but he doesn't say that. Chrysostom continues. As the Father uses the expression, I am, so also does Christ, for it signifies continuous being irrespective of all time cool now uh the messiah was foretold by god himself you know that the messiah was foretold to be god himself emmanuel mighty god isaiah 9 6 mighty god wow uh el gabor Divine throne, okay, a reference in Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7 to his divine throne. He's the son of man in Daniel chapter 7, coming on the clouds of heaven, okay. He's the angel of the Lord. Um, he's a very mysterious character in the Old Testament. I mean, this is uh, pretty cool here. Um, this statement is so such a clear definitive statement of his divinity only god could say something like this i suppose if he was an angelic being he might now, even then he couldn't say that no angel is is the great i am this is just a clear claim to be divine the source of all being um it's like when he says the father and i are one right um it's just, that's another just amazing, only, who can say that? The Father and I are one? What? Okay, uh, I think we'll just, uh, we're at an hour and eight minutes. I uh, feel a certain degree of satisfaction here, folks. I'm sure you do too. That we have finished chapter eight. Chapter nine is the blind man. And uh, we'll continue on next time. Uh, but yeah, six and seven both took, chapter six and chapter seven both took seven classes to get through. So you people are doing some hard work, man, plowing through all this material. And now uh, I got through chapter eight, incredibly enriching experience, and it only took five classes. So uh, we'll see how we do with chapter nine. But I don't think it's going to be any big monster. I think we'll get it through it in four or five. We will see. Don't want to make any predictions. But until then, God bless you.